Okay, looks like we can get started, Shoaib. Yes, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the um, webinar on project N2 of Stride. The title of the project and this webinar is Data Fusion for Signalized Arterial Performance Measurements. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Nagy Rafael, and I will be presenting um, this webinar together. I'll present the first section and then he'll take over and continue until the end of the webinar. Um, me also welcome you all, um, just in terms of uh, logistics. Um, uh, at any time, if you have questions, please feel free to enter those in uh, the chat box at the end of the seminar. We will be reading each of the questions and try to respond uh, best we can. And we may have a couple of additional announcements at the end as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nagi. And today's webinar is sponsored by the Stride Center. Uh, Stride is at the 2016 USDOT Region 4 University Transportation Center. Um, we are a consortium of 10 Southeastern colleges and universities with the University of Florida as the lead institution. The mission of Stride is to develop novel strategies for reducing congestion. And again, to emphasize, we invite you to contribute questions at any time through the chat box, and we will answer them at the end of the talk. An outline of today's webinar, I'll provide a little bit of definition on data fusion and also provide the motivation for this project and work that we have done. Then I'll go ahead and talk about the fusion framework development and uh, apply the, de the developed fusion framework to two different um, uh, applications. The first one, we'll talk about signalized arterial travel time estimation. And the second application will uh, look at the signalized intersection approach delay. Um, after that, we will provide some conclusions and recommendations, and we'll close the webinar with um, future research directions regarding this project. And also, as uh, Dr. Rafael mentioned, we will have an announcement the, at the end of this webinar. All right, so what is data fusion? There's a multitude of definitions that can be found in the literature for data fusion, uh, but one of the more comprehensive definitions um, is that fusion involves the combination of data and information from more than one source. In performing data fusion, the goal is to improve the quality of the information so that it is, in some sense, better than it would be possible if the data source were used individually, the data sources were used individually. Um, as we know, operating agencies and public agencies have access to more and new data sources for performance assessments. And when they are deciding on which one to use for the performance metrics or assessments, they must consider cost availability and accuracy. And each of the sources that are available to them come with inherent errors and biases, and they usually stick with only one data source to look at the performance metrics where it has a bunch of errors associated to it. And we believe that multi-sensor fusion has the potential to produce improved estimates of the performance measures by combining these desperate data sources that are available to these agencies and putting them together will give a better picture of um, the phenomena that they are looking at. This project is only looking at data fusion in the context of signalized corridor, uh, and that's the focus. We also would like to bring uh, light to a couple of national um, efforts that's going on related to data fusion. The first one is the NCHRP 08157, which develops best um, uh, practices for data fusion in the context of transportation engineering. And the FHWA um, future publication that will dive into the applications of uh, data fusion and transportation engineering. So we mentioned that there's there are a lot of uh, data sets that are available to public agencies and operating agencies, uh, and these data sets could be roughly categorized into three different categories. 
Um, the first could be the link data, um, for example, the NPM or the uh, other pro data providers like TomTom Tom, and Rex here, um, sensor data like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, loop, radar, and um, camera, video camera data sets. Um, the other category could be trajectories. For example, I2D, for those of you that are familiar with that, NGSEM, which provides trajectory of um, a bunch of traffic streams at different states. Um, and also DFS, which is data from sky by using drone footage and extracting trajectory and other traffic stream information from it. And obviously the newly available data sources uh, like connected vehicle data. And the last category would be the control data. For example, in this category, we can, we can put signal timing plans, split monitor reports, and automated traffic signal performance measures or ATSPMs. Um, within the realm of signalized intersection corridors, as I mentioned, agencies tend to have access to multiple data sources. Each of these data sources come with varying data quality and um, complex data relationships. And a data fusion framework is needed to integrate multiple data sources, improve the data quality, capture the complex data relationships, and support decision making. Um, as I um, um, mentioned, there are a bunch of um, fusion data fusion processes representations that exist in the literature. Uh, for example, a few of those are functional, architectural, and mathematical. Uh, this project uses the functional data fusion process model to deliver the framework which utilizes disparate data sources for geospatial and temporal fusion of the traffic data. So functional data fusion model represents the associated functions, databases, and connections required for the underlying processes. And the framework that we have developed, it comprises of four different modules. The first one is geospatial performance assessment. The second one is performance measure selection. The third one is intra-source, and, and the last one is inter-source fusion. And at the first uh, module, uh, the geospatial uh, coverage of the measure is determined. And we have roughly two different levels for this, the system level and the path level. On the system level, it, it compri it's comprised of one or a collection of nodes. For example, lane groups, approaches, intersections. And on the path level, it's uh, usually a combination of nodes and links. Uh, for example, a, a signalized corridor that may have multiple intersections and you look at performance metrics such as, such as travel time that provides path level information. Then the second module is performance measure selection where uh, the analyst picks the performance measure and the, th the third um, module is the intra source. Uh, this um, a step looks at the initial two steps of the geospatial and performance measure to see the data that is available if it is to the to the same extent that the geospatial level is looking at. For example, if you if the performance measure is looking at intersection delay, um, is the data available for the intersections or is it available at lane group level? If it is uh, not to the same resolution, then the intra-source fusion comes in to put, put up together lane group uh, delay information so that it makes up the intersection delay. And then the last um, module is the intra-source where uh, if you have multiple data sources for the same performance measure, then you're going to use different um, fusion algorithms to conduct this and hopefully get a better performance of that particular metrics. Diving a little bit deep on the geospatial data fusion model mo module, as I mentioned, it has two different levels, the system level and the path level. And um, the functional data fusion module that I mentioned, it represents associated functions, database, and connections that is required for the underlying process. Um, the entity relationship diagram that's shown in this slide for the system level and the path level indicates how data with different spatial resolutions are combined for a given uh, performance metrics 
um, um, for, for both the system level and the path level. Um, uh, on the system level, for example, if you're looking at an intersection, um, that intersection could be a combination of or made up of approaches, which in turn could be made up of lane groups. And under each of these entities, we have different performance metrics. For example, for the lane group, you have volume, delay, a yellow and red actuations, and a few more metrics. And uh, similarly for the path level, under links, you have different performance metrics that we can take a look at for signalized quarters. And for the path, you have different performance metrics that we can take a look at. Um, so after the development of the framework, uh, we applied it to two different performance measures that cover different geospatial levels. Uh, we looked at travel time, fusion of travel time that covers the path level. And then we looked at ATSPM approach delay, which covers the system level uh, geospatial performance assessment. Um, we also validated the uh, output of the fusion process to make sure um, and see uh, if the performance, if the fusion process is actually um, performing better compared to single source data sets. And we believe this is something that, that sets apart this work from others um, because it is looking at uh, the validation piece as well. So moving on to the first application, um, uh, looking at the signalized quarter travel time, um, I believe all of us on, on this webinar will probably know the importance of travel time as a performance measure, and it's typically obtained from a single source, for example, a vehicle probe, loop detector, or Bluetooth, and we know that each of these come with their associated um, biases and errors. For example, Bluetooth has the uh, location detection error where vehicle probe is basically a sample of the traffic stream information that we have access to. Um, and since public agencies have access to multiple data sources for travel time, that enables us to do a diffusion of these different data sources. Um, again, to emphasize that the um, validation and evaluation of the fusion process is important. Um, we need to do that in order to make sure that the fusion is actually uh, actually uh, beneficial or not. It's difficult to do this without access to the ground through data. Uh, we have had access to a bunch of these different travel time data sets, but we mostly when we're looking at, we don't really have the ground through travel time. Uh, as a result of that, this project relied on NGSIM data set uh, to create and simulate these different data sets and also um, be able to evaluate the individual and the data fusion um, algorithms and processes against the ground truth data that we have available. Uh, moving on to the study site for the arterial travel time estimation, as I mentioned, we used NGSIM data set. The particular data set that we used for this um, application is the Peachtree Street in Atlanta, Georgia. We have a full trajectory data set available for all the, ve all the vehicles that, um, that is uh, active on the uh, study site. And the study site is comprised of five intersections. Four of them are signalized. The distance from north to south and south to north is about 2,200 feet. Um, one of the major limitations of this data set is that it only has 30 minutes of data um, in two chunks of 15 minutes. So coming to the data sets, what are the available data that we have right off the bat from the NGSM data set? We have the ground truth travel time for all the trajectories for northbound and southbound. We have the signal plan, uh, which shows the individual cycles in a split. We also have uh, the volumes at each of the uh, signalized intersections and in every location of the study site. Um, so what do we really need? Uh, we need to have multiple data sets to be able to perform diffusion. Um, uh, so as a result of that, we simulated a few data sets um, that are shown here, Bluetooth, um, fixed sensor and probe vehicle. For Bluetooth, we put two different units at the uh, north and south of the, the study site to get the Bluetooth travel times. And we introduced location detection error 
uh, based on the data that we had collected um, from locations that had Bluetooth devices installed at, at them. And then uh, we also developed fixed sensor data sets and probe vehicle with uh, uh, sampling the trajectories with varying market penetration rates. And the data sets that are shown in green here are the data sets that were used for the fusion uh, process. Uh, and um, we used different metrics for evaluation of the error um, and the performance of the um, fusion modules. Um, mainly RMSE, MAPE, and MAE were used. In terms of the fusion algorithms that were considered and used in, in this um, um, application, uh, we started from simple um, algorithms like linear regression, simple average source of travel time to more complex uh, neural network-based modules and tree-based modules of random forest and clustering methods like uh, nearest neighbor. We were planning to do further uh, exploration of algorithms, but the data set that we had were not really um, uh, res responsive to the, those type of um, algorithms. So moving on to the, uh, the result of the fusion application. Uh, we have in this slide the, the error analysis for individual sources versus diffusion. If you take a look at the um, if you take a look at the plot here, uh, this is actually divided into two different sections. On the left side we have single data sources and on the right side we have fusion algorithms. Sorry. Um, so what we see here is that on the single source uh, data sets, Bluetooth has the lowest error compared to the ground truth. Um, and on the right side where we have the fusion algorithms, it's worth ma making note that the results that you see here, the fusion includes all of the four data sets that were shown in green in the previous um, slide. What we see here is that most of the fusion algorithms are are outperforming the single source data sets except the simple average. And ANN tends to perform best uh, here. And looking at this, we can uh, conclude that the fusion gains actually depend highly on the choice of fusion algorithm. Um, we also looked at the impact of data availability on the performance of the fusion process. We uh, we, we starved the algorithm uh, with some of the data sets that we had available. For example, if you take a look at the figure here, um, the, the blue bars that we have includes uh, Bluetooth plus uh, probe data plus signal and loop detector information or data sets that we have. And then we, we tend to, we, we um, took out some of those data sets and run the fusion models to see how they perform. What we found out is that the more data set that you have available, the better your output of the fusion will be. Um, however, different data sets have different weight to that um, improvement. Bluetooth data sets adds the most value, what we found out, and signal timing and loop detector, on the other hand, had the least value under the assumed conditions. Um, and again, we came to the conclusion that the best com combination depends on the algorithms um, that you select. Although the data availability was impacting the output of the fusion model, but it seemed that the choice of the algorithm is the a dominant factor. Um, coming to key takeaways, we, we saw that the data fusion produced improved estimates of signalized quarter travel times. And again, the outcome of the fusion process depends on fusion algorithm and data availability. Some limitations that I touched a little bit on this uh, for this application is that we had limited data set. We wanted to do and apply more fusion algorithms, but those were mainly very data intensive um, algorithms and we could not apply those here. Um, we also are aware of potentially um, errors and bias that were introduced in the simulated data set, although we tried our best to, to uh, keep those um, errors and bias out of those and also make sure that the errors that are inherent to those types of data sets, for example, in Bluetooth, where you have location detection error is actually introduced in our simulated data set. 
with that, I'll uh, turn uh, to Dr. Raphael to present the next piece. Nagy, please take it over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shoaib. And as we mentioned earlier, we will take your question in the chat box at, uh, at the end of the webinar. So let me talk about the second application of data fusion. Uh, and uh, just to you, some of you may be aware of ATSPM. This is a, um, a, a method that is now using um, some high resolution sensors in order to be able to do automated signal timing performance measures. And what we mean by that is rather than going out and do queuing studies or delay study, can we take advantage of the existing sensors to give us those data in an automated fashion and therefore enable us to get some quality of service measures in real time. So uh, in this section, I'll talk a little bit, I first define what we mean by ATSPM. What is the problem statement that we are addressing in, in this section? The methods that we've used, and again, how we tested that method with real world data, as well as, as uh, Shoaib has mentioned, uh, validating against the ground truth as well. Next slide, please. So what is ATSPM? Um, it basically enables high resolution data logging at signals. It provides information needed to identify and correct signal deficiency. So if you are measuring the performance, in a corridor, you should be able to know which signal is uh, subpar operationally uh, and which signal works well based on the delay trend that you're seeing. Uh, and again, let me be very careful here, even though we use the word approach delay estimation, which is associated with ATSPM, what this project is focused on is really more of a lane group delay. If we focus on through traffic, we're trying to look at through uh, lane group um, uh, delay, not the entire approach, which could include all the turning movement. How does the base ATSPM works? It's a very simple, uh, essentially because it's able to determine when a vehicle arrives at the sensor, it projects its arrival at the stop line and basically uh, calculate how long that vehicle will wait. Uh, if it arrives in red, it knows when the next green will start and therefore it makes an estimate of the delay that way. So it really is more of a stop line delay, if you will, uh, at, at the signal. Uh, if the vehicle arrives during the green phase, or it's projected to arrive during the green phase and a zero delay is assumed. So very fairly simple approach. Uh, now, uh, what does ATSPM require in terms of sensing? As you can see, here's an example of a neural section with ATSPM detection. Um, we have arrival and departure detection. The arrivals are on the upstream end and Again, you could see here it's a little bit, uh, one has to be very careful because the arrival detectors are actually collecting all the turning movement as well as the through movement while the uh, departure detector could be lane by lane and can be specified by movement. Uh, there is also possibility to only use departure detectors and we'll talk a little bit about how will that work. Uh, so based on what I described about the ATSPM, it does neglect the effect of acceleration deceleration. It assumes straight arrival at the uh, arrival speed. Uh, it obviously ignores the fact that there may be cues at the stop line and enforce the effect of cycle failure. So in order to improve on those estimation based on uh, a method of data fusion, we've developed two algorithms in this project. One is called the arrival departure, which takes advantage of both arrival and departure detectors. And a second one that uses only uh, departure only detectors without really needing to look at uh, arrival detectors. And uh, 
if you look at the table that is at the bottom of the slide, it just shows you of those four components of stop, acceleration, deceleration, and the effect of an initial cue, uh, whether that particular method uh, addresses or takes into account that component of delay or not. The green implies it does account for it, the red does not, and the yellow, it may partially incorporate those effects. So next slide, please. So how does this work? How does the arrival departure? If you are familiar with uh, most HCM approaches, they basically base on what, what we call cumulative arrival and, and departure uh, estimation to estimate the delay. So on the graphic that you see on the top right, we're using both sensors and we're tracking individual arrivals at the solid blue line on the left. And as those individual arrivals are accumulated, we know what the signal timing is and we can generate that cumulative arrival pattern. Similarly, at the start of the green, we can track using the downstream detectors, we can track the individual vehicle departure from there. Now the dotted line uh, adjusts these arrivals and that's an approximation as well, adjust these arrival to include the travel time between the upstream sensor and the stop line. And that is the dashed line that you see on that figure. And in essence, what we do in every cycle, we calculate the, or we integrate the area between the arrival and departure and estimate that total delay and the average delay for that cycle. Uh, obviously, if there is cycle failure, they will, the number of uh, departure and the arrival will not be in balance. If the queue clears before the end of the green, then obviously uh, the delay will be confined to those within that area. So that's fairly, that's how we actually calculate delay uh, analytically in the highway capacity manual. When we get to the departure only, there was some interesting idea here, which is if we track the departure uh, headways of the individual vehicles. And now I'm talking about the bottom left graphic. Uh, and if you could see here, uh, while there is a queue, it's likely that those departure will be at the saturation headway. So by tracking the rate of departure at saturation headway, and once that rate of departure begins to uh, decrease, then we can say the queue has cleared. And the idea here is to be uh, knowing what the red time is and knowing the departure during a queue, we can estimate again the area under that triangle similar to what we do there with the assumption of course that even though we're not tracking um, individual vehicle at the upstream signal, we're assuming that rate is fixed. So that uses less data of course, but also makes a lot more assumption. And on the right hand side, this is what basically we're assuming to occur during uh, the individual cycle. So we're leveraging those headway in order to identify the queued and unqueued vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the case study data sets, again, just like we did with application one, uh, we are essentially uh, putting together the signal data and the detector data. So it's a two data set being uh, combined. Uh, initially, we've we've, we did that analysis on 22 signal uh, using once month data in Salt Lake City, Utah. We applied the three methods. And again, this is primarily for comparison. In those data set, we did not have access to the ground truth delay. So we're just comparing ATS, ATSPM and the two alternative using in this case, the um, 
the system framework where we're looking at the link group ID and the link group delay. Um, and then we essentially use the detector volume and signal control data to do the estimation. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a little bit confusing, but just to navigate you here, we have four different uh, trend of delays. So on the X axis are um, time on the Y axis is the average delay in every cycle. And the top, bar, the, the top left graphic is looking at the entire day on the top right, we're looking only at the AM PM peak, which makes it a little bit more readable. On the bottom left, we're looking at the midday. And on the bottom right, we're looking at the PM peak delays. And one of the things that is important to notice here is the comparison between the methods. And as you can see here, generally speaking, the arrival departure method, as you can see, generates or reports much higher delays than the ATSPM method does because uh, even though we're not tracking individual vehicle, we're tracking arrival and departure at different points. While with the ATSPM, it only just project the arrival and it's very clear both the ATSPM method and the arrival depart and the I'm sorry the departure only method both tended to yield lower delay. We just we know that for a fact. We expected that for the ATSPM. We slightly did not expect that for the departure only, but at least on that side, um, we we showed that they were also much lower than the arrival departure. So. Uh, in one way, it does, uh, you know, confirm at least when it comes to ATSPM that that method will always tend to underreport the delay at the signal, uh, but we just don't know by how much. So uh, as a result of this, well, this is useful, but again, in the absence of ground truth delay, we could not tell which one would be the more appropriate to use. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, this is also another comparison, but this is looking at violin plot. And violin plot centrally give you the entire distribution of delay across the different time period that we looked at. And again, those four plots refer to the four time period we discussed. It's very clear if you look at the ATSPM method, which is uh, colored in um, purple, that this has the shortest range of delay being reported because again, it is confined to the, the maximum red time that one could be, could be encountering. And uh, on the other hand, the arrival departure had a very large range of average delay. It, was encountering and the departure only was somewhere in the middle. So this is important in terms of range of delay that each of the method can provide. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, just the comparison, uh, ATS PM reports lower delay, as, as we mentioned early, they do neglect certain component. Arrival departure did provide higher delay. Departure uh, only produced slightly higher delay, but nowhere near what we saw for the arrival departure method. So that's nice, but now obviously that kind of prompt the next question, how close to reality those are. So next slide, please. So again, we, we needed to validate those algorithm uh, and we needed another set of ground truth delay. And lo and behold, we use the same data set that we used earlier, but now we're focusing on uh, individual intersection or individual intersection delay as the method by which we're doing the evaluation. So that because we had access to individual trajectories at each signal, we can actually 
measure precisely the actual delay per vehicle in each one of these cycles in each one of those intersections. And we can compare that with what those methods would produce. Okay, next slide, please. So again, you've seen the slide before, that's the um, validation data sets. Uh, we have we had the four signals, as we mentioned, and we focused again here on uh, northbound and southbound movement on those, at, at least we'll show you one, one of those intersections. And we applied the three methods for delay estimation to compare them with the ground truth. Next slide, please. So what you're seeing here is uh, not the actual delay, but essentially uh, the difference in delay estimation or the delay estimation error cycle by cycle at one of those signals. Uh, the Typically, you would see the same trend across these other signals as well. So again, remember, we only had 30 min 15 minutes of data, not a lot of cycle. But what you could see here, three columns, one uh, showing the difference between the ground truth and the um, particular method average delay in each cycle. A positive number would indicate that the method generated delay higher than the ground truth, a negative one a delay lower than the ground truth. Uh, and it's very striking, obviously, when you look at the arrival departure, uh, the mean error, and this is not the mean absolute error, it's just overall mean error of 2.8 seconds or about 5.7% error in delay estimation. The classic ATSPM method, as expected, we knew that all along, but we now have confirmation of the amount of underestimation about 8% or 16.7%. The departure only were, was even worse in this particular case, uh, generated much lower delay. And this had to do really with, um, I wanna mention a little bit of the issue with the departure only. Uh, we always, when we do our traffic analysis, we say every vehicle, departs a two second headway uh, in reality and whether it's because driver not very uh, attentive or so forth, uh, the distinction between when the queue is discharged and when we have free flow condition beyond the queue is, is very vague. And using a deterministic model like a departure only in most cases, tended to give us a wrong time of, del of, of Q lens estimation. And that's for uh, it actually had huge errors compared to what we saw with the other ones. So uh, in general, what we're seeing here and what our research has found that we do need to use the two detector to get a much better estimate of approach delay uh, that would get us within five to 10% of the actual field delay. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, just to summarize the validation here, uh, the arrival departure method, as we said, outperformed ATSPM consistently. Uh, the departure only method fluctuates, but mostly, uh, it, it, it failed because of the assumption of uniform arrival throughout the red. And also uh, we did, does not really account for some of, the, some of the right turns that may be happening in red. And the base ATSPM, as I mentioned, always consistently underestimated the true delay. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, I guess these are overall conclusions of the work. Um, the, we have demonstrated from the first application that the signalized corridor performance could benefit from the fusion of disparate data set. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, if you're, uh, if very often many state agencies already have had 
uh, some kind of loop detection on their system and may even have contracted uh, to get probe data uh, from a third party. So the, the use of both of these data sets could help along with the signal could help improve the travel time estimation. Uh, one very important piece here is that we do find that the arterial travel time benefits from the, from the presence of a Bluetooth data set. Of course, the longer the corridor, the less uh, you, know, you will get a, a lower sample of travel time, but it, whether it's by itself or including other data set, uh, Bluetooth was found to be the best methods uh, in terms of a data set to use in future. Uh, the application of, uh, in terms of the developed framework to, to the ATSPM, uh, we also show that the fusion improved the, the accuracy, but we strongly propose, unless we find different results with additional data sets, that the arrival departure provides a very reasonable estimate of the approach delay compared to ATSPM without really the need to um, where the need to have the two detection pieces. Uh, and again, the improvement level depend on the availability of the data set, uh, the data side and the appropriate function or the algorithm. Next slide, please. So uh, we, uh, you know, as we mentioned, one big limitation wh while having trajectory data helps both in really generating data set and validating against the ground truth. Uh, the size of the data we think is not sufficient to, uh, to provide final conclusions on all of these, but uh, we wanna apply to a real world scenario we happen to have additional data set taken from um, uh, trajectories collected uh, by US, uh, uh, US videos, which allow us to, to create both um, the, the ground truths as well as simulate a lot of these data sets. Uh, and finally, we would be good to see, and we, we think it would be easier to transfer a lot of what we have here to uninterrupted flow facility, for example, freeways or two-lane highways or multi-lane highways. Okay, next. Uh, so I think this would conclude uh, our presentation. Uh, just uh, uh, a piece of information, the final report is, being evaluated at this point, uh, reviewed at this point, and uh, it will be posted, it is posted on, uh, it will be posted, I'm sorry, on, uh, on the website for Stride, and also on the in Wales has just uh, created or uh, posted that link in the chat box. So it is not available right now, but it will be uh, available. Also just the, an additional piece of information. We did some additional work uh, in the in that is included in the report that we just did not have time to talk about today that focus more on the effect of broadcast frequency and aggregation frequency. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of information on pro vehicle and to what extent uh, again, comparing the different uh, frequencies of probe vehicle and how they impact errors against ground truth. Uh, and as you see my, the last slide here, uh, uh, these are upcoming seminar or webinar. Uh, if you have an interest in any of those, they just gives you uh, the dates and typically these would be at noon uh, on, on those dates. So thank you all, and we will be happy in the remaining 15 minutes or so to take any questions. Um, Nagy, we did, we did have, I believe, three or four questions. Um, okay. I, I answered them 
in the chat box, but I, I think you may be... want to you may want to speak mm -hmm. on those as well. All right. Yeah. So the first question is, it seems like linear regression is also comparable in terms of performance to ANN and KNN. Um, so why going uh, to complicated methods? So the response is that, yes, uh, based on the data set that we looked at and the fusion that we did, from the graphics, it looks like it, they are similar, but there is a difference of probably about 10% or less than that between ANN and um, linear regression. And ANN is ten, tends to be better than a linear regression. Uh, but we believe uh, that the reason why we have a slight difference is because um, we didn't have a large data set because ANN is a very data intensive algorithm um, and the hyperparameter tuning process requires a lot of data well, we had a very limited number of data points in this uh, application. So that's probably the major reason why the difference between the two is not huge. But if we had a bunch of other features for the ANN and uh, a large data set, I believe that uh, difference would be um, significant statistically when comparing them. Um, so that was the first question. The, Second question, Nagy, was have you done data fusion analysis at great crossing? Do you want to uh, take that? No, or... I don't know. We, we have not. I mean, again, the we focused on data. Um, we focus on data where we had the ability to compare to ground truth. So unless we have trajectory data at a particular location that can capture the ground truth. We wanted to make sure that we apply it where those data existed. So hopefully that answered your question. So uh, if you do have trajectory data, whether, and that's why we really focus on NGSIM because that allows us to create those data set and also to validate them using the same data set. Right. And um, I believe the last question is, did you consider a corridor of four intersections for the travel time estimation uh, or travel time fusion? We did use the four intersection corridor. So the site that we showed you had four, five intersections, four of them were signalized intersections. The travel time that we considered went from, uh, was in both directions, northbound and southbound. So uh, those four intersections were included in, in that fusion method where we had looked at combined and combined and fused all of the data sets that were available. One piece of, uh, or one of the data sets was the uh, signal plans from those signalized intersections that we incorporated into our framework. Uh, however, on the ATSPM approach delay uh, methodology and application, uh, we, only looked at individual intersections and approaches of those intersections. Yeah, and let me also just, uh, I wouldn't call it a warning, but if Bluetooth units will tend to lose a lot of vehicle, the, the longer the arterial will be, because it's basically, is gonna try to match vehicle entering on one end and uh, the other end. So it's, you know, while we did find in our case, we still had a reasonable sample size of vehicle that traversed the entire uh, method, the entire arterial, uh, the longer the arterial, the, the, you're gonna get fewer and fewer sample and uh, you may get into issues of uh, validity in this case. The, the, the other issue related to, and, and we didn't mention that, um, with with uh, loop detectors. When we put the loop detectors, uh, typically there may be, these are not related to the signal. These are could be related to just traffic counting and speed measurements. Uh, because they're put in the middle, they will tend and people basically use those speed to estimate travel time between sensors. These will tend to also underestimate travel time significantly. And that's why 
you saw those errors with, with the loop detectors being quite high. Now, um, the new probe data, those of you may be familiar with some of the new probe data, they go into what they call sub-TMC estimation. And sub-TMC takes a, a TMC across a large area and divided it so that you can get speeds even very close to the intersection, which could account for the delay. But we did not do that in, in this work. Yeah, and uh, the last request, or uh, I don't know if that, that's not a question, um, is to send um, the presentation. Uh, I think we can do that. I'm not sure if Andine can comment on this, if the presentation will be available some somewhere on the website. If not, they can go ahead and send that to you. But I, I noted your email address, and I'll go ahead and send that uh, presentation to you. Yes, so I just uh, on the put a note on the chat that she can send the presentation to the registered uh, guests. Thank you, Andine. That's it, correct? Uh, yes, that's that's the final question. Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention and for the good question that we received on the presentation. And uh, hopefully um, once the report is posted, we'll let you all know and Dean will let you all know. And uh, uh, we posted here our email. If there's any follow-up uh, with either one of us, feel free to email us as well. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone.